And it's a real pleasure to be associated with this event uh, and to see, uh, having been a speaker and uh, attending on many international conferences, to see such a success here in Paris. So thank you. A big uh, applause for Jean-Luc, please. Yeah. First of all. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Alexandre Alfonsi. I'm one of the founders of a boutique called Investment uh, Axonia Partners. We are an M&A um, advisory boutique fundraising for companies. But we also fundraise for private equity funds uh, that are based in France, Europe, uh, in the US, and in Southeast Asia. More importantly, over the last 10 years, we've been very much active in Africa. We have been assisting many private equity funds based in Africa, raise capital from international sources. In fact, we believe we're the number one advisor in that respect, having worked on more than 10 mandates, uh, a little less than 10 mandates at the moment, but actively seeking to, uh, to do more. In any case, we have a lot of uh, uh, interest from international investors at the moment uh, to invest in Africa. I think uh, both, both institutions and family offices alike are very much interested uh, by the work that has been promoted uh, by various institutions, by the impact investment themes, ESG themes. I think everyone today realizes, like Vivina was saying this morning, that uh, having uh, risk-adjusting superior returns is compatible with having strong governance and uh, an impact on the ground. So I think this is, um, this is very uh, important today to understand from, from you who are creating those guidelines and those standards, uh, how you go about your line of work and um, you know, how, how the, the landscape is currently evolving in Africa. So uh, Anne-Catherine, you're the head of company relations, MENA and Africa at Vigio. Uh, it's a rating agency with a focus on ESG and you work both with companies and investors. We have Brett Sevenson, who is a manager of the capacity building program at the GIN, uh, which was presented this morning. And you are covering Africa and Asia, and you're addressing the missing middle, quote unquote. And Philippe, you are the CEO of Ethic Intelligence, uh, an organization that is certifying anti-corruption uh, corporate uh, uh, programs. Uh, I understand you're also the chairman of the anti-corruption um, commission of the French Council of Investors uh, in, in France, uh, the CN, in, in Africa. Sorry. Um, so perhaps as a first step, uh, I'd like uh, maybe for you to introduce yourself a bit further and perhaps explain uh, to the audience how you go about, how you go about um, designing those guidelines and standards. Uh, maybe I should start with uh, ladies first, maybe Anne-Catherine. Uh, Vigio, wh what do you do? What kind of guidelines are you promoting? Um, and and you know, what has been your experience so far? Thank you very much. Uh, so Vigio is a CSR rating agency. Uh, we work with both investors who buy our research on ESG factors on companies, states and local authorities. But we also have other services addressing directly companies or organizations uh, where we can assist them in giving opinion on how they better can do the integration of ESG and uh, how to measure their performance. So we don't actually create guidelines for norms as such. Sometimes we have been part of creating norms, like the ISO 26000, which is the international award CSR is and is not, that you may know of. Uh, however, we do take into account and promote a certain number of norms and standards, like, for example, towards investors. Uh, we also are a member of it, uh, like the principles of responsible investment. Uh, that investors, asset managers and banks, etc., can sign upon. Uh, towards companies, uh, we do promote reporting initiatives like the GRI, the, the Global Reporting Initiative, uh, because it gives a good basis for evaluating performances, which is comparable uh, across different sectors and worldwide. Uh, we also think that initiatives like the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative is very interesting to see. Uh, so far there are three, I think, three stock markets in Africa that are members. And it has the, um, uh, the good part that it's uh, really a dialogue between stock markets, regulators, investors and companies on how to better take into account ESG criteria. Uh, we also promote and use uh, the green bond principles. Of course, sustainable bonds are not only green, 
uh, but that is really something that we believe can be a good basis for future work when it comes to sustainable bonds. Maybe so far I will stop there. And, and Brett, what, what is your link uh, with uh, organizations like VGO and uh, how do you operate in the uh, impact in, uh, and, and the ESG space? Uh, so the Global Impact Investing Network is an organization that's dedicated to growing the impact investing industry kind of generally. Um, so we have over 200 members, uh, organizations across the industry, um, of which several are um, on the Investors Council, which is large-scale investors that invest in impact investing. Part of our um, mandate is to help investors kind of make sense of the market and to um, find each other, reduce, reduce transaction costs, that sort of thing. And one of our key areas of that is kind of defining what the space is. And I think most of you saw a presentation this morning um, by Mr. Savellino of um, EAPE. And we put a strong emphasis on measurement within impact investing. And basically, we see impact measurement as a hallmark of what kind of differentiates impact investing from other types of investment in the market. And that's partially it because it's a way to uh, kind of set, like demonstrate your commitment and intentionality to the concept, but it's also because it allows you to prove to investors what, what you're accomplishing as well as improve the output of what your investments are actually um, creating. When the linkage with ESG is, is an interesting one because um, ESG in its essence is looking at more of a do no harm risk management strategy whereas impact investment is looking at creating, intentionally creating social and environmental value through the products and services that the businesses uh, have um, that you're investing in. And most of the fund managers that we work with in Africa have investors that care about ESG or in the future they're looking to attract investors that care about ESG. Um, and so a lot of our fund managers are required to both abide by standards that, <laughs> that are on the ESG front, which tend to be a lot more policy um, and procedure oriented, whereas at impact measurement, you're looking at uh, data-driven decision making and marketing. Um, so they kind of, they're different in nature, um, but there's quite a bit of interaction between the two. Thank you. Philippe, you're a bit more on the prevention side of things, if I may say. Uh, perhaps you could describe your line of work, which is somewhat a bit taboo uh, when it comes to Africa. Yes, in fact, we are, um, so I chair the, the company called Ethic Intelligence. We are a certification agency, and we are entirely dedicated to certify anti-corruption program, which are enforced within companies to prevent corruption to occur. Even if we are the world leader in, in this activity, maybe I should say a word because it might be strange for some of you. We, we have designed terms of reference, which are based on some legal requirements coming from the United States, United Kingdom, Italy, some case law, some guidelines from the OECD, ICC, Transparency International. Then we accredit inspection companies like SGS, like DNV and other inspection companies, and they are carrying out audit on the basis of these terms of reference. Then they come back to us with a certification file, and we have a committee of international lawyers in the States, in London, in Germany, in France, in China, and in many countries, and I select three of them, and they will review the quality of the certification file, and they will award a certificate. Recent companies that have been certified, the whole Airbus group with all the branches, Cassidian, Astrium, Eurocopter, and so on. Very recently, Tractable Engineering, and there is here as uh, the African director of Tractable Engineering. And I saw in the list of participants, there is someone from Schneider Electric. Uh, and I know that today, Jean-Pascal Trequois, the CEO of Schneider Electric, is in Kenya, uh, and is confirming that his objective to have all the subsidiaries of Schneider Electric operating in Africa certified by the end of 2015. This objective will be achieved. We are certified already in Egypt, in Morocco, in South Africa. Nigeria is ongoing. What we do is maybe useful for investment fund because when you invest in a company, you want to ensure that the turnover is sustainable, that the turnover is entirely based on legal activities and not on bribery. And if at the end you have the idea of selling your asset, 
it is extremely important to demonstrate that the quality of the company is really based on activities which are banning completely corruption. And it's the reason why we have more and more requests from investment funds, from private equity funds, asking us to look after their subsidiaries. And just to finish and to complement what Brett has said, we have also designed a specific certification system for small companies. So far I spoke about large companies like Alstom, Tractable Engineering and so on, but we have also a product which is for small companies with a pricing which is really adapted to that and we have contact with some of them uh, in the room. Thank you. In fact, this is uh, just as an echo as what, what you just said. We, we have a similar approach. I think when, when you look at the, the performance of a fund you, 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 and you want to figure out whether you want to take them on or you want to work with them, it's important to understand what part of the track record is based on their privileged access to certain situations and what is repeatable performance, what is value added. And so we have to look at, at the performance as, and understand really what, what is unfair, sustainable, uh, what is unfair advantage and what is sustainable value creation from the team. Um, and I think you know, the fact that organizations like yours get involved is, is actually an increased, uh, uh, provides increased visibility as well on the performance of, uh, of, of those managers. And this is the reason why we work closely with Vigio. Not closely, but I know yeah. Vigio is looking very much at what we do, our terms of reference, because when performing your rating, you take that into account. Maybe uh, you can elaborate on that. Yeah. Uh, yes, of course, when we talk about governance of companies, especially uh, anti-corruption policies are very important. And it, it's a, not a guarantee, but it does mean that if the company has taken the the decision to go towards these kinds of services, this means that they take it really seriously, that they, they have implemented policies and that they have had the certification of course, proves that it's a quite a robust system that they have set in place in this, on these issues. So let me ask each of you a question. Is, is it easy at the moment to promote those guidelines? Have you, have you had some difficulties in doing so? And can, maybe can you share on the positive side some successes that you, you've experienced? in Africa, uh, in promoting, for instance, uh, ESG guidelines? Uh, what we do see is that uh, there is a tendency to, to really move from seeing ESG as only as a risk management towards uh, feeling the need to really to prove results in a meaningful way and going towards impacts that we see specifically among high accountability actors uh, when it's public money, for example, or high accountability and risk sectors like oil and gas and mining. But we also see it more largely now. Uh, this, the successes that we see, that's not specific for Africa, but in general, uh, there's a quite as a consensus now that taking into account at least ESG risks today is is seen as something that is positive for all of the actors that are involved. Uh, we also see that the tools, initiatives that do exist more and more that are sector specific, sometimes they're country specific. We see, for example, in Morocco and Tunisia and also in, in Sub-Saharan Africa initiatives that are addressing these issues, uh, that these are developing fast, which means that there's a real interest and uh, consensus about the, the benefits of this, this approach. I can jump in. Um, when the, the gen looks at impact investing in Africa, generally the, the kind of the group that we're working with is fund managers who are investing in um, the small and medium sized enterprise market because that is where most of the growth and most of the activity is happening. And the real challenge is getting down to smaller deal sizes that these companies can actually absorb. Uh, and so the intermediaries end up playing a really, really important role because most of the investors want to deploy capital in much larger amounts than what these, ca these companies can handle. So when it comes to kind of implementing both ESG and impact measurement standards, for impact measurement, what we're really finding is that funds are, are struggling to operationalize um, impact measurement for a variety of reasons. You know, one, the companies they're working with are low capacity. And partially because, um, skills-wise, but largely bandwidth. Like, these are a lot of startup companies that um, but you just don't have a lot of extra time to spend on anything that, that may seem superfluous to them. Um, but also because these fund managers are aggregating impact measurements across 
multiple companies across your portfolio, which may or may not be very similar. A lot of the fund managers in the market are not specialists in any particular sector, and if they are a specialist even a sector, they may be investing in companies that are along the value chain, and so the impact metrics become very, very different. So when you look at the metrics that are, you're actually able to aggregate across multiple companies, you end up with you know, number of clients served, number of jobs created, which tend to be fairly surface metrics. And so that can be difficult. The other side of it too is that they often have multiple investors in their capital stack, and each LP has a different impact motivation. It's, you know, it doesn't come down to the bottom line of, of finance, um, or it doesn't come as down to a bottom line as easily as finance does. And so oftentimes they get an overwhelming amount of requests from investors for metrics, and so then they're, they're in a position where they either have to create oh, kind of overblown systems or they're really needing to negotiate with their investors on what they actually do measure. On the ESG side, what we're finding is, like I mentioned, most of the capital in the market is coming from DFIs, and therefore uh, funds are looking at um, meeting ESG requirements as well as the impact. The ESG requirements tend to be uniform, whether it's a small company, medium company, or a large cap company, whether it's in Africa or Mexico, and a lot of these small companies are really struggling, once again, with the overwhelming <laughs> kind of just volume of, of requirements that are, that are placed on them. And so a lot of what we're working on is trying to help uh, these fund managers negotiate with their LPs to figure out something that actually is reasonable for them to really handle. And also, what's, what's right at what stage of a company? So when you look to exit, you know, when, when the company scales down the road, ESG principles need to be really in place and those systems need to be rock solid. But when a company is struggling to get off the ground, a lot of the ESG requirements are um, just not that realistic given what, you know, the size and, and priorities of, of the company at that stage. Maybe I respond to, to your questions with two comments. First, designing the norms are not difficult per se because we have a lot of guidelines coming from different jurisdictions and, and international organizations. What is difficult is that corrupt practices evolve. So for companies to prevent corruption, when these practices are evolving, they need also to adapt their process to prevent corruption. And it's a reason why we have every year in London a worldwide meeting with the, the legal council of the certified companies with our lawyers, which is called uh, emerging issues and the search for best practices. So we constantly adapt our terms of reference to ensure that they reflect the reality of the complexity of corruption. What is more difficult is, is to convince companies to invest in compliance programs to prevent corruption. In many cases, they see that as an obstacle to do business. I will share with you a, a feedback I have recently. It was not from Africa, but uh, it, it's a country which is difficult in Russia. We, we certified Equant in Russia and it was four years ago, it has been renewed, and one of the reasons the CEO said we want to renew the certification process, because the certificate is valid for three years, he said, since we have been certified, since the certificate is on our letterhead, on our website, on our commercial brochure, since we communicate on our commitment to do business without resorting to corruption, extortion solicitation has diminished we have less difficulties with the administration. So this is something which was surprising for us, but extremely interesting. And it's also the reason why a company like Schneider Electric is willing to have its companies operating in Nigeria, uh, in South Africa, and so on, certified, because it's also a way for them to, to resist to extortion solicitation. Oh, indeed, I think the, the signaling part is important. If, if some, peop some groups in the ecosystem start signaling that they are doing things properly or in, in, uh, with a view to, uh, to, to promote ESG, uh, all the partners also understand that and want to, uh, want to follow suit. I think we see that in funds, for instance, where the DFIs have shown the lead in catalyzing investments that, uh, that meet certain guidelines and standards. I think private investors, when they see that, they feel much more comfortable that they can follow suit as well. Likewise, in private companies, we discussed over lunch uh, one of the cases we recently worked on where we, we, there was impact investment capital together with private capital with the idea that the two objectives could be perfectly aligned. So I think this is, this is a theme we're seeing increasingly. 
And um, you know, your line of work definitely helps in structuring that, uh, that, that thinking. Uh, I was wondering, maybe back to some of the questions we had uh, informing this panel, uh, how, how do, can governments help uh, either here in Europe or in the US or, or in Africa in, uh, in your line of work? Philippe, maybe you, you want to get started? Uh, yes, maybe when it comes to corruption, and, and I speak only about corruption of public officials, clearly, clearly it's an issue which concerns both companies and government, and they have to work hand in hand. I, I take the opportunity in saying that I, I chair the, the Anti-Corruption Commission of the French Council of Investors in Africa. Ten years ago, we published a declaration on this issue whereby we stress the importance of such a collaboration. And 10 years after, at the next General Assembly in March, there will be a revised version of this uh, declaration. So I do believe that government and companies have to work more closely together. And if I can give an example, one way would be, when it comes to call for tenders, either from government in Africa or from aid agency, in many calls for tenders, you already have some questions regarding sustainable development, environment. Why don't you include in the call for tender an element regarding what you have done to prevent corruption? And this will contribute to level the playing field. We should remember that foreign bribery is a crime in only 41 countries. In other words, if a Chinese company is investing in Africa and if this Chinese company pays a bribe in Africa, it is not a crime for this Chinese company in China. It will be a crime in the country. Whereby, if a French company pays a bribe in Africa, it will be a crime in the country and it will be a crime for the French criminal law. So th there is a clear distortion of competition, and if we want to level the plate field, probably asking companies to demonstrate that they have taken appropriate steps to prevent corruption will be extremely useful. Thank you. I heard the bell ring, so I guess we're almost short of time. Jean-Luc, do we have time for one or two questions? Uh, we audience? have passed the 30 minutes that was allotted to the, this panel. Uh, I will suggest that we take some questions from the audience, and I have one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everything about uh, our discussion also is to get uh, the LPs comfortable with Africa and uh, dedicate money for those who don't yet, and dedicate more money for those who have started investing. And what is the relationship do you have with the various LPs uh, communicating uh, uh, your businesses, what you are doing, and how this is helping uh, creating uh, an environment that is favorable to uh, investment? And then uh, maybe you want to re respond later on. We could take two questions from the audience who want to pose a question. You have one question there. I will borrow a microphone from you. Brett, thank you. And a question, please, not a commentary. My name is Mr. Ag from Bukazala Hotel. Uh, young hotel chain in Western Africa. I have a comment and a question. Just as an, entre an African entrepreneur, we want impact measurement because we're the ones who are suffering from the lack of impact measurements. African entrepreneurs are suffering. However, 
One thing needs to be thought about when you look for and try and implement something. Generally speaking, as was said this morning, African SMEs were set up with young entrepreneurs who were pretty much penniless. They had a little, they had to work a little before being able to open up. They worked with, inner, uh, with profitability rate that never went beyond 15 to 16%. So by opening to these funds, we're asking them between 25% or and more. This creates an imbalance between the, prof the real profitability of a company, its environment, and it actually pushes it away from its social responsibility. My question is this. What has been done for there to be this balance between this looking for equity, social responsibility, and the profitability that donors are asking for. So, one final question. I'm really delighted to see that the Azalai group is still going on with their um, lobbying. We met Mr. Bali three years ago, who talked to us about um, impact investing. So, your question? My question is for Mr. Philippe Montigny on digital identity. Now, Europe has just adopted regulations on digital identity, IDIS, on one market with um, one appellation for companies and moral persons. We've got another program called France Connect. What about Africa Connect, which is also in a pipeline for an African digital identity? So response from the team. Just to answer the gentleman who spoke right now. Just to answer the question that was asked right now, I have no answer to give to this. We, are only, we only focus on corruption, nothing else. We're pretty one, we've got a one-track mind, really. The other question from Azalai Hotels, which is the cost of impact and uh, how this is uh, uh, waiting on the, the, the performance of the, 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 the small firms. I guess I can um, try and answer that one. Um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult question because we definitely feel a tension with uh, the way the entrepreneurs are experiencing impact investment versus the way the fund managers are versus the way that LPs are, and every level um, sees things quite differently. Um, we hear from LPs that a lot of the fund managers' um, fund thesis and economics aren't balancing and that they're over-promising on, on um, their IRRs <coughs> as well. Um, and at the same time, the, you know, fund managers are often caught in the middle trying to, to make it on, on both ends. But we also hear from entrepreneurs that fund managers need to do a better job of... Um, of speaking the language of entrepreneurs, that when they talk about all these investments and impact metrics, and um, they're essentially uh, speaking completely different vocabularies and, and from a very different world. And so a lot of it actually, I think, comes down to translation um, and alignment within the partnerships that come um, come within the kind of the value chain of investment. Um, the other side of it too is just you know one of the reasons that the fund managers feel the pressure to to bump up the IRRs is just you know the, the model that a lot of people are building the impact investment industry off of is just the traditional industry. So there's a huge adherence, for example, to the two and twenty model, and it's it's like there's, there's outliers that are starting to push and getting three to four percent um, management fees, but in general there's a lot of pressure to to adhere to the traditional industry standards. And so it's, I think it's part of the evolution of the industry as people lead and show that they, these things do need to change and they, they understand that overpromising is dangerous and they navigate those partnerships. I think we'll find a balance where um, entrepreneurs like you won't be feeling as much pressure, but it's certainly a challenge. Maybe I could add that what I, or what we believe is very important is, is the principle of local ownership 
I think it's very important that each country has a clear view of their own needs and priorities to which both investors and company actions could align to. Otherwise, everyone comes with their own agenda. And also to develop reliable and updated statistics and metrics on country level and regional level to which when a company or an investor wants to measure their impact or their contribution, they actually know the, the context of the country in question. And there, there's Mike, a re lot, of, uh, lot of work to be done, I think, to have access to that kind of information in order to be able to measure. If I may add to that, I think we see fund proposals from all over the world. I think there's an increased inflation today to push for higher returns or pretend, pr promise higher returns which we all know will not get, be get delivered. As a result, the African fund managers who want to also shine in this market and, and try to get their, their attention are sometimes over-promising themselves when we know as well that they might not be able to execute on those returns. And I think what they should really try to do for many of them is, would be to differentiate themselves from the, from the crowd by not promising higher returns but showing what they can do on the ground to promote higher employment, development, and contribute as well to the, uh, to the overall uh, development of the continent. So it's not only a, a risk return game. I think we are now entering a dimension where uh, people who allocate assets from the top also want to see more than returns. In fact, I had a discussion with a large, large pension fund recently. They say, you know, they, they have so much money to deploy, they only want to be in top quartile, but if you make the math, they can't be top quartile. They have so much capital, mm -hmm. which means they have to go to the second or third quartile. And rather than do that in the developed world, why not opt to do something else and sell their LPs as well, other metrics than just the sheer risk return uh, uh, dimension. So I think we're, we're getting there slowly and, and conferences like this one are really helping the case. Um, so I guess we, we can... I believe I got uh, some of element of uh, responses to my questions. And uh, I got two points actually. Number one, education of the LPs about the reality of Africa and the return that they could get. Uh, but also that uh, maybe uh, practitioners need to think a little bit about uh, uh, impact metrics specific for South countries, because the impact metrics you could define for a country like uh, USA or France or UK are not the one uh, that would be appropriate for the SMEs uh, in, uh, in Africa. So thank you all for your contribution to this panel. <laughs>